So Ephesians, we're working our way. It is determined. It is now in depth, uh, working our way through Ephesians. And uh, we saw in those first three chapters all the heavenly blessings we've gotten from God by grace. It wasn't by our worthiness. It wasn't by our works. God didn't save us because of what we would do in the future. Yeah, yeah, God picked a lemon right now, but he knows eventually, you know, I'm going to be a big hitter and that's why he chose me. Untrue. That's just completely not true. It's not by our past works, our present works, our future works that we're saved. It's not of ourself, of the past, ourselves, of the present, ourselves, of the future. We are saved because of God's goodness, because of his power, because of his death and resurrection. It's all getting your eyes upon him. He's the author and the finisher. And so Paul spent three chapters to make it clear all eyes are upon him. All salvation comes from him as a gift. So we wouldn't make the tremendous giant mistake of taking the lens and putting back on ourselves. In Christ, he's the author and the finisher. All religions of the world, people say, how do you know the difference? Christianity sticks out like a sore thumb. All religions of the world focus on man. Most of them focus on man right at the beginning. You need to grovel and come to God. You need to see your sinful condition and and beg for forgiveness from God. You, yes, you have this void in your life and you sense that you can't just live in the physical realm. You need a spiritual life and, and, and it's on you. The burden's on you to find God. It's on you to get right with God. It's on you to maintain a rightness with God. And so when you look at all religions of the world, it's this giant weight. I, I think a perfect example of this is what I saw when I was in Mexico City where the road up to the Basilica, they have two giant lanes in the middle of the road for people to crawl on their knees on asphalt uphill for two miles to get to the Basilica. So then they take a padlock. They used to tie ribbons on it in the old days, but the priest would come out and cut the ribbons off eventually because they're just starting to look bad. So people say, forget the ribbons. They put these padlocks on that you can't cut off. You literally have to cut the fence before you could cut these padlocks. But it's basically saying, God, you owe me to heal my child or to forgive my sins or to make me rich or whatever because I just walked two miles uphill on asphalt on my knees. So look at my acts. Look at my works and, and, and grant me a request because of what I just did. That, that's the exact opposite of Christianity. The gospel's good news. It's full of joy. It's not of ourselves. God doesn't answer prayers because we had a really good righteous week and we got 10 righteous points. That means you can get from a low degree prayer to a medium level prayer answered. Or you could save those 10 points and try for two weeks in a row. Then you could ask for a much more serious prayer. So you want to cash them in this week or you want to see if you can make it two weeks in a row. Now I'll just let you know, if you do mess up, oh, those last 10 points go away too. This is the weird thinking of man. The Bible tells us over and over again, it's a relationship. My kids could act horrible. And I love them. Oh, my goodness. And if they thought in their head because they've been acting bad this week that my love for them has gone down, they're wrong. (laughs) And when I see them struggling in some area of their life, 
I want to embrace them and love them and help them in any way I can. Humanly, we're limited. God's not limited. So when they were teenagers and they, they didn't like their bodies and they were wanting to get stronger or lose weight or whatever, it's just, oh, I, I, they're struggling with your flesh. I love you. Or if they're having a hard time with some sin in their life as a human dad, I, I didn't want to, I can't believe you. Just stop it. That's the answer, you know. Just say no. <laughs> I, I just, oh, Lord, pray, praying harder for them. My love for them grew or just... My focus was on them more. This is the way our God is. Like the prodigal son's dad. Every day he went out and looked down that long road to see if his son might return. And he had a robe with him, a ring with him, sandals with him. He wanted to make sure when his son walked into town, there would be no schism and rumors. No matter how tragic his son had let his life go. He walked into town. He was going to look like he had succeeded. Nice robe, ring, sandals, all intact. That's grace. Where our sin abounds, what? His grace abounds more. Do do we understand this? So it would be tragic if we took the next three chapters of Ephesians and focused on ourselves. As he says, you know, we've been covering the topics of honesty and anger today, stealing and our tongue. To say, okay, now God is basically passing us the baton. Okay, I died on the cross. I paid for all your sins. I cleaned you up. Now I'm passing you the baton. It's up to you now to start doing righteously. That is not happening. (laughs) There's no baton passing. Because our, in our flesh, there is no good thing. And if there was one thing we could do to screw it up, is anybody here thinking they might not screw it up? Because you come up and start preaching. Adam and Eve, what did they have? Just on all the planet Earth, out of the trillions of trees, out of the gazillion different types of fruit, don't eat one fruit. Can you believe that? And they messed it all up. That's us in our human nature. And I might add that Adam and Eve didn't have sinful flesh at that moment. (laughs) They had a leg up on all of us. And they still did the one thing. There was only one thing you could do to mess it up. And they did that one thing. That's why it says in Romans 4 that Abraham learned it wasn't of his flesh but of the work of God so he could have his salvation sure for himself and to all those who believe. So we are saved by getting our eyes on Lord and saying, you love me. You've called me. You bore my sins on the cross. You died. You rose again. Your Holy Spirit's in the world convicting men of sin and righteous judgment and you're drawing us to yourself out of your power out of your word out of your love and and when we come unto you you put robes of righteousness upon it you take this heart of of flesh or of heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh you cause our spirit now to long for you and want to do your will and now in this sinful body what do I do I just keep looking to you and your grace his forgiveness his love his mercies that are new every morning his faithfulness Even when we're not faithful, it doesn't say we're struggling with faith. We have no faith. We are faithless. He remains faithful because that's, that's, we get our eyes on him. He's the author and what? The finisher. How is this thing going to end well for us? We get our eyes on him for salvation. 10 minutes later, one day later, 10 weeks later, 10 years later, 50 years later, however long we live. We keep our eyes on him and we never take our eyes off his grace, his mercy, his love, his kindness, his goodness as our shepherd. If the shepherd comes back with one less sheep, who gets in trouble? The sheep (laughs) or the shepherd? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and all that come unto me are in my hand and of them I lose what? 
nothing. All who come unto me are in my Father's hand, and none shall perish. He's greater than all. John 3.16, you believe in him, you will not perish. You will have everlasting life. He's not toying with you. He's not making this blanket, all-encompassing statement with a bunch of footnotes. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. He's not toying with you. He's not saying, okay, well, that's the upfront statement, but now you got to read the 300 fine print footnotes. You, you don't perish, you have everlasting life if, 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 if you go to church, if you pray enough, if you write the Bible, if you stop sinning, if you do start sinning, clause 21.a says that you might lose it or, or maybe I didn't save you to begin with and that's what you're proving by this. And there's no toying. There's no toying with you. But we've got to keep our eyes upon him to have the feeling of assurance and to have the joy of our salvation. So get your eyes on our shepherd. He's our father. (laughs) You fathers being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? God, here's my gifts. I just want to glorify you. To whatever degree I'm loving you with my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength. I want to love you before I die and leave this human body. I want to love you a million times more than I love you today. Me and my wife just had our 38th anniversary this week. And uh, and we have the same conversation every year. I I love you more now than I ever did before. And it's sort of almost a joke to think on the day we got married that we loved each other. <laughs> we, I, I don't know if we really did compared to our love now. And I feel the same thing with God. I, I literally want to be more holy as he is holy today than I've ever wanted to be. I, I want to be sanctified, set apart for his use. None of that out of fear. None of that of going, God, I want to be holy because I can feel it now. You're going to send me to hell. And I know, you, I know you're gracious and said I won't perish, really have everlasting life, but I don't think you counted on me being this weak. And there's some guys out there that say that you can lose it. And there's some preachers that say that maybe it's proven I never was saved. Ah, okay, I want to be holy because I'm afraid. I want to live for you and I want to be a good, good Christian because I, I want to go to heaven. I want to be right with you. There, there's no beauty in that. There's no joy in your shepherd. The joy in the shepherd when the sheep are calm. And they enjoy being in the, in the pastures of that shepherd. There's no joy in the father keeping his children on edge all the time. There's homes like that. Some of you were raised in them. Dad's home. <gasps> oh my God, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> Stop, everybody. You know, you have an alcoholic dad or something or just some domineering, legalistic dad, just the idea of him coming home is just, oh, you know, I just, I, I need to try to stay under the radar between the time dad eats dinner and goes to bed. There's no joy in our father in that way. He's our husband. We're engaged to him. Do you know how joyful people are between the day they get engaged and get married? That's like some of the sweetest months of your life, isn't it? That's where we're at with him right now. So again, as we come here and say, so now be honest. Now stop being angry. Now stop stealing and, and, and watch how you're using your tongue. It's not to focus our eyes on ourself. It's simply to say, God's Holy Spirit is leading in us away opposite these things. He's doing it. Join him in that. And, and, and understand his heart. Interesting, when I first started going to Central and South America, lying is a part of the culture. It's not seen as lying. It's just, they lie. 
It's just understood. Everybody, to some degree, is lying to you. And also, if you're stealing from somebody richer than you, it's really not stealing. It's just a, you know, reappropriation of wealth, the way it should have been to begin with. (laughs) So it's weird having these pastors of churches that are just lying and they're stealing and this is just a part of the culture and to try to help them to say, look, this this is an American Christian telling you this. The Bible tells you this. But to try to get them to see something that was so culturally okay as wrong is hard to do. And then there's been other cultures that were under communism and under the Russian Soviet communism You got the job that you have. You're passing out papers on this corner. You get paid this much. You're never going to get paid more. And you're never going to get a different job. You're going to do that till the day you die. So people just didn't care. They didn't care if they showed up on time. They didn't care if you bought a newspaper or not. And people would put in a couple hours work. So the communism fell and people had to start working. It was hard on them. Because they never had really worked eight hours a day before. (laughs) They had never had to be on time for a job before under communism. And they were stealing, in essence, by the way they were working or not working. So we come here today, and there's two important things that we need to understand, that if we are going to overcome any area of sin in our life, it's by the power of the Spirit. It's by the work of His grace. It's not God saying, pick up your step and start disciplining your flesh and start being more obedient. No, it's us going, God, give me greater grace and give me the greater filling of the power of your spirit. And by your power, by your goodness, by the work on the cross, it is finished. All the sanctification as well as all the justification, you do it. I see that I'm stilling. Forgive me. Now, by your power, give me the strength to overcome this area that's in sin, that's flesh, that is wrong. Well, in verse 28 here today, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give him who has need. So he's saying, stop stealing. Now the area, interesting enough, he's going to focus on is in the workplace. And we are going to see this later on in the book as well. But in the workplace, you can steal from your boss by not working the way you should, having bad work habits or uh, not having a strong work ethic, just doing the bare minimum. And another way of stealing is by pilfering, by taking something that wasn't yours at work because your boss isn't paying you what you should, so I'll just go ahead. I had a guy, a friend of mine, that owned a grocery store, and it wasn't shoplifters he was worried about. It was people that worked there that would literally take 10 boxes of diapers because, you know, he doesn't pay him what he ought to. Ought to. I'm, owed these 10 do- you know, I'm owed these 10 giant boxes of diapers. That was the problem. And he's, in essence, saying don't, don't steal from your boss just because you think you deserve more money than he's paying you or don't leave early and have somebody else click your time clock because you're, you're deserving of it uh, and he's not paying you what he should pay you. As a matter of fact, um, in Titus, he, he tells us, the believers there who are leaders, to tell them no more pilfering, that they may adorn themselves with the doctrine of Christ in the workplace. You say, man, I want to be a witness at work. Be honest. Get there early. Work hard. I, I had a boss, and, and he taught me when I worked at a, like a chick, Kentucky Fried Chicken. It was called the Chicken Shack. He said, if you're here 15 minutes early, you're on time. But if you get here on time, and now you're finding your robe, and you're washing your hands, and you're getting ready, you're, you're actually late. And I carried that with me through all my jobs. Get there 15 minutes early, you're really on time because you got to get your brain wrapped around it and get stuff going. And if I start five minutes early or whatever, that's okay. But if I start five minutes late, I'm stilling. In the same way, don't start a half working the last hour of your shift. I'm getting out of here, man. I'm just sort of standing around until I can punch the clock. 
These are things that, that he is saying that if you are being diligent to be honest and to say, I'm here to make my boss money. I've been in many stores and trying to find people help me to find an item. And they're just like, nah, you know, it's down that aisle. I don't care if you find it or not. I get paid the same either way. Well, your job is there to make that company money. Not to stand around and be a human being doing nothing and frustrating all the shoppers. <laughs> but yet there's people that do that. They'll hang out in the back of the store and, and uh, play cards, smoke cigarettes, and, and take a 15-minute break that lasts 45 minutes. Don't, don't still in the workplace. Secondly, we don't want to be stilling by unwilling to work at all. Matter of fact, in Thessalonians, he says there are some who are walking disorderly, and one of the ways is they're not working, just looking for handouts. <laughs> they had an interview the other day with a group of people on Venice Beach who are living on the beach, and, and they thought they were going to find some, one thing, a bunch of insane people, but they found one group after the next going, oh, no, I'm, I'm from St. Louis. I just heard we could live on the beach for free and no rules and all the marijuana we can smoke. So we all saved up our money, packed, <laughs> packed everything we could, and we're just out here basically living in the Wild West. And they found that over and over again. We're here because it's a possibility. That's human nature. If I, if I owned a hamburger truck and I said hamburgers with French fries, with mustard and relish, and, you know, and I put on there hamburgers with Nutella chocolate, peanut butter, and uh, sardines. You know how many people would order that just to go, it's on the menu. Might try it, see what happens. This is our human nature. And there are ways, the culture, and we may have read this 2 Thessalonians 3 and other times saying, oh, people not wanting to work. I'm trying to picture that. <laughs> picture it no more. It's, it's a, literally a disease destroying California. And <laughs> I saw a girl the other day, a teenage girl the other day, and she had on her shirt, it said, common sense, it's my superpower. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know what would, you know would cure the homeless problem? Common sense. And that ain't going to happen in California. <laughs> or at least not by the current administration. So common sense is what we need there. But there he says, here's a little common sense. If you don't work, you don't eat. Wow. Do you realize that? If people living downtown LA and Venice Beach, nobody fed them, they would have to go somewhere to find food. But basically, we're enabling it, and that's exactly what they're saying. I need a bottle of water, it's right over there. I need a new chest set of clothes, right over there. I need a doctor, I, they come by, I just see the guy, when get some medication. And the good, good people come out here from all the different places and feed us, and man, we're, we're, we're everything we need right here. Why would we leave? Well, if they gave you a place to live, it's not going to be on the beach. <laughs> This is what these people are saying. It's like, yeah, duh. I, I live in a place that's also not on the beach. Um, and if I could, I would. But nevertheless, he, he says here very plainly, another way of stealing is stealing from the body of Christ by you putting the burden on everybody else to help you financially rather than you working a third way we can still is by not paying our taxes. Now, I'm not saying don't take an advantage of every legal loophole you can. I, I think that's being good stewards. Not giving your money to the government these days is good stewardship. But uh, rather having as much money as you can to give to missions. Give to buying Bibles with the Gideons. They'll put a Bible in every hotel room in the world they can. There you go. Second, or Matthew twenty two twenty one, Jesus actually said um, to him, Caesar, he said, who's the coin, who's the picture on the coin? He said, Caesar's. And he said, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But interesting, the next thing he says ties into point number four. Don't rob God with your tithes and offerings. And Jesus actually says that in Matthew twenty two twenty one. But give to God the things that are God's. 
Guys, if you read Genesis to Revelation, here's, here's what you will see. Honor God with the first, the best, the top of everything. That's it. I remember on our honeymoon night, we got into the hotel and we just got on our knees by the bed and, and we just said, God, we, we give you our bed. Lord, we give you our life together. In every area of our life, Lord, we want you to be first. And nobody told us to do that. We didn't read that in a book. We just had a, had a guy the other week invite him to church. Well, I, you know, I, I, I do stuff here and there, and I, and I often work on Sundays. He's his own boss. He can make schedule the way he wants. And I said, well, honor God with the first of your week. That's why we meet on Sunday. We give him the first of the first of the week. That's why we meet Sunday morning mornings rather than nights. We're giving God the first, the best. You know, Saturdays we try to rest, and now the first of our energies are going to be to worship God first. If you honor God, he will honor you. If you will give God the first, the best. This is the last book of the Malachi. People were just tired. It's hard to walk uphill to Jerusalem. It's hard to go there. It's hard to have to. Do, and God finally says, I'm wearing you out. <laughs> I, I, I'm, t- I'm, I'm sorry that it's wearing you out singing to me. I'm sorry I'm wearing you out by praying to me. I'm sorry that it's wearing you out having to give tithes and offering. I mean, you imagine if God said, hey, give me 50% and you live on 50%. We wouldn't have questioned it. He's God, right? But what does he do? He says 10%. And yet people are then trying to shave that 10% down to 8% or 7% or 4%. And it's like, guys, it's really a, such a minimal amount. We should immediately say, that's, that's ridiculous, God. To give you the top 10%, that's, that's not fair to you. <laughs> Here's an offering. And God makes that allowance for that offering. In Malachi 3, he he says, you've robbed me. They're going, how can you rob God? He said, in tithes and offerings, you've robbed me. And then he he says, test me in this. The Bible's repeated. Don't test God. That's a sin. Satan tried to get Jesus to tempt God by jumping off the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. But Malachi sort of throws that all on its head by saying, Test God in this. See if he won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you. And of course, we know all of that is storing up treasure in heaven. It's uh, give and it shall be given back to you. So these are different areas that we can still. There's other ways we can still as well. But these are the ones that we find in the Bible. But he says, instead of stilling, do what? Labor working with your hands. He's going to go into this in in Ephesians 6, where he says, work is unto the Lord. And if your boss isn't paying you, God will give you the reward you should have got when you get to heaven. Work is unto the Lord. I might just make a note that overworking is also a sin. In Psalms 127 too, it says, it's vain for you to rise early, to sit up late, to eat the breads of sorrows, for he gives his beloved in their sleep or in the, the rest. In Proverbs 23, 4, do not overwork to be rich. And he goes on to say, those riches will make wings like an eagle and fly away. And so we, we want to not still, but labor. And then he says, and then to be able to give to him who's in need. In Proverbs 11, 24, 25, there is one who scatters yet increases more. There's one who withholds more than is right and leads to poverty. The generous soul shall be made rich and he who waters will be watered himself. And there's other Proverbs on that. So what do we see in this verse on stilling? The negative is don't still. The positive is have a giving spirit. Work, labor with your hands. And why? The reason why? So you'll have a giving spirit and give to him uh, and who's in need and and be able to give that which is right to God in our tithes and our offerings, putting God first and giving to man. And and this is uh, God's plan that you'd have, instead of a stilling spirit more and more and more, to have a giving spirit. I'm going to work hard and ask God to bless the work of my hands so I can have surplus money to help out others. 
Well, in verse 29, also put off speaking corruptly. In verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the ears. The word corrupt is literally like a fruit going rotten. Don't have rotten, stinking language. And in chapter 5, we're going to see neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting. That all these things that uh, the world has no qualms about doing. Don't you be a part of it. So we're, we're really at a disadvantage when it comes to our tongue, right? Because we are in human flesh. And in Romans 3, it tells us our default human condition. In Romans 3, 13, their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they also practice deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. In James 3, verse 6, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. And he goes on to describe it, how it just brings great damage, starting like forest fires. In Matthew 12, Jesus tells us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and it's not good. And by those words, corrupt words, will be held accountable for in the day of judgment, a lack of reward, or in speaking healthy, good words, a reward. So don't speak corrupt communication. On the other hand, but speak what is good for necessary education. I don't have that verse in here, but I remember that Ecclesiastes. God's in heaven, you're on earth, let your words be few. Um, that's uh, Solomon and all his wisdom. But James 3, 2 tells us this. For we all stumble in many things. Get an amen there? Well, yeah. Uh, but in verse 3, 2, if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. Wow. If you have the ability to hold your tongue, every other sin in your body is, is small in comparison to this big one. In James 1, 26, if anyone among you thinks himself religious but does not bridle his tongue, deceives his own heart and his religious is useless. David prayed in Psalm 141, 3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. <laughs> I need you to put a couple of angels, one on the right side of my mouth and another on the left side of my mouth, and just make sure nothing stupid comes out of it. Boy, we, who would like those kind of bodyguards? Um, James also tells us in verse one, chapter 1, verse 19, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, but notice, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So here's really a couple of things of purpose in our heart. Number one, be slow to speak. And the other thing is what's necessary for edification. 1 Peter 4.11 says this, if anyone speak, big question mark, if you've got to open your flap, if, you, if, there's, if there's a need to open your mouth, he says in 1 Peter 4.11, let him speak as it were the oracles of God. Wow. That just penetrates deep into my soul every time I read that verse. So how is, it, how is it that we're to speak the words in the exact right words in the right moment? Oh, how good that is. The Psalms and the Proverbs talks about that. Psalm 71, 8, let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory all day long. There's a good reason to open your mouth. Proverbs so David's son, Solomon, who learned a lot of smart things from his dad, in Proverbs 15, 23, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth. And listen to this, a word spoken in due season, how good it is. Proverbs 25, 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. I might just make a note and balance of that. That Ecclesiastes 3.1, Solomon goes on to say, there, in everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. And then he says in verse 7, a time to keep silent, but then there's also a time to speak. So it's equally wrong to not talk when you should talk. Do you understand? 
So to, so to think, this is simple. I'm just going to have the doctor sew my mouth shut with a little sippy straw. I need to lose weight. And uh, I'm going to be really fruitful. No, no, no. It's not about keeping your mouth shut always. It's just when you do open it, let it be to edification. But then to realize there is a time that to not be speaking is also sin. Well, finishing up here, the last phrase of that verse 29, that it may impart grace to the hearers. I love what it says about Jesus. They're observing Jesus. And everybody bore witness, the multitude, as they saw this young carpenter come back to Nazareth. They're listening to Jesus speaking. And it says, they marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. They all were just going, oh, it's just healing. Oh, it's grace and mercy and kindness. Oh, wow. He was just gracious. And it tells us in Colossians 4, so let your speech always, always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So the negative here in verse 29 is, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. The positive is, let the words come out of your mouth that bring edification and the reason why that we may impart grace to the hearers. There's why you need to open your mouth because the world needs truth, right? And the Bible says you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. But people also need not just truth, they need grace and truth. Yes, they need to hear their sinners, but before they hear their sinners, they need to hear that Christ loves them and that he died for them and rose again to take care of all their sins. We need grace and then truth. And Lord, we thank you for your word this morning and just the exhortation to continue to keep our eyes upon you, that you started this, our eyes are on you. In the middle of this, our eyes are on you. And when we're breathing our last, our eyes upon you. You are the great God, our Yahshua, God, our salvation. We cannot save ourselves. Our works cannot save ourselves. We cannot improve ourselves (laughs) by the works of our flesh, not spiritually anyway, that that which is going to change the heart and to love you more and to walk more righteously and holy in you, it's by the power of the Spirit and by the work of your grace deeper in our hearts and our lives. If you're here today and you're getting it today, you're realizing, you know, I've, I, it's me. I'm that other kind of religion beating myself up and walking in fear and anxiety, trying to, approve, to be approved by God, trying to get God to love me, get God to forgive me, get God to please me. To, and out of fear and anxiety, you're trying to, to seek God and going to church and praying so you're not blackballed by God. That's not the true gospel. That's another gospel. The true gospel, just like the thief on the cross, Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. His testimony in heaven is not of myself. It's not of my works. It was just a gift of God. And it's true for all of us. By faith alone, I believe in you, Jesus. I need a savior. I am a sinner. And I believe now because your word says that I shall not perish, but I will have everlasting life. And Lord, strengthen us all in your grace this day. In Jesus' name, amen.